In this series of lectures, we're going to look at the guts, the details of ordinary least squares. And most people will title this kind of topic looking at the assumptions of the classical linear regression model. And so in lecture five, of course, going to be a multi-part lecture, just like the other ones, we're going to look at these assumptions and Sometimes people will talk about the assumptions of what has to be true in order to properly use the ordinary least squares model, which is otherwise known as the classical linear regression model, by two people who proved a theorem about these assumptions. And we call it the Gauss-Markov theorem. Now, Gauss was a German and Markov a Russian who both proved the same thing and they proved when should you use ordinary least squares and when might it not be a good idea to use ordinary least squares. And so in this lecture we're going to look at those assumptions and and, and in this you know, what I'm calling lecture five series of lectures the point is to get a basic understanding of these assumptions and then typically after you get a basic understanding of these assumptions uh, an econometrics class will spend the rest of the semester going through these assumptions one by one and trying to figure out ways to check to make sure this assumption is true learning what happens if it's not true, how you can fix it if there's a problem, and what kind of problems it could cause if you do nothing. And so we're going to do the same thing. So this is a key lecture that you cannot ignore. You need to make sure you understand the basics of what these seven assumptions are about. And then I'm going to come back later and we're going to attack these assumptions basically one by one. But first, it can take a long time just getting the basic idea behind what these assumptions are. So let's get going. Uh, I just have to point out at the beginning that this topic where you're trying to cram in all this information about the basics of these uh, ideas is the most technical. Uh, it's a lot of information being thrown at you at one time. It's probably the most feared lecture, and, and I would say it's the most feared by teachers and students alike. But it's also the most necessary lecture. If it wasn't absolutely necessary to learn this in this way, we would find a better way. So I'm not trying to frighten you. I'm just going to say there's a lot of information that's going to come at you. And it's going to take a lot of 10-minute lectures to, to cover this information, even at a basic level. So overall, what we're trying to do, once again, is answer the question. When we're estimating slopes from some randomly collected data, when is ordinary least squares, these formulas we were working with earlier, uh, to find the slope that minimizes the sum of the squared residuals, when is that the best method to use in order to find our slopes and our y-intercept? So this is another way of phrasing this is, is when is it the best method. So before we can answer that question, first we have to ask, well, if OLS is just one method, what are some other methods? And we call these methods of generating slopes and y-intercepts estimators. And so what is an estimator? It's just a method of taking our data, doing something to the data, and generating a y-intercept and generating some slopes. So minimizing the sum of the squared residuals is just one way. Now let me show you some other ways. So again, the one way that we've learned, and this is the most common way that people use, even today, even though it's a method that's been used for a lot of years, is to minimize the residual sum of squares. Now another pretty common method is what's instead of called OLS, ordinary least squares, is called GLS generalized least squares. Now generalized least squares means that we're not just minimizing the sum of the squared residuals, uh, 
but we're also doing something else that might correct for some problems. And we'll actually learn uh, some GLS techniques later on in the courses. So GLS uh, adds some things that you do when with the data rather than simply minimizing the sum of the squared residuals. Another option would be, I need to call this option C, is to minimize the sum of the absolute values of the residuals. Why square them and minimize the sum squared? Why don't we just look at the absolute values and minimize that sum. That would that would minimize the overall distance between the data and the line. Why not do that? Well, some people do this method. Some people actually use minimizing the sum of the absolute values of residuals. Turns out to be a lot more complicated than minimizing the sum of the squared residuals. The mathematics behind it is much more difficult, but now with fast computers, it can be done, and some people use this method. So that's another possibility. Uh, another method that has been gaining in popularity in the last uh, 15 or 20 years are Bayesian methods. Now Bayesian methods in a statistics class you should have learned about Bayes rule or Bayes theorem which is a way of taking a prior belief, collecting data, and updating that belief. And so for example we may have some prior information that the slope of a certain relationship is 2. So using that prior information that we think it's around 2, let's collect some more information and use Bayes rule to help us update the slope. Maybe we used to think it was 2, but now we've collected some data that makes it more likely that it's 3, for example. So you can use Bayes rule to update your estimate of the slope and then calculate the probability that the slope is in a certain range. So that's called a Bayesian method. Another common method is called maximum likelihood. Sometimes maximum likelihood is good if some of these rules, some of these assumptions of the classical model are violated. Uh, basically maximum likelihood looks at the data and chooses the slopes in the y-intercept that would be most likely to randomly generate the data that you collected. That's called the maximum likelihood method. Now there are lots of other methods out there. I mean another one, this is kind of silly, but you could do what we've done in some of the lectures. You could just draw a line that looks good to you. That's a method. Might not be the best method, but sometimes it might work. So there are a lot of different ways to estimate slopes and y-intercepts. These are just a few of them. So we need to be able to answer uh, when is OLS, this first one, when is that the best one? Before we can get into that, we have even more preliminaries. Do you see how complicated this can get? Uh, a couple of other things to, to go into. First, we need to be to have an idea of what a linear estimator is. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. A linear estimator though is basically an estimator that just uses a linear combination of the y variables. Uh, a linear combination of the observed dependent variable to calculate the slopes and the y-intercepts. Uh, what's the alternative you ask? Well we could have a complicated function of involving uh, each observation of the y variable and other values of the y variable and some other complicated, more complicated math than just adding and subtracting and multiplying. That's basically what we mean by a linear estimator. And when we calculate the OLS estimates of the slope and the y-intercept, it just involves adding, subtracting, multiplying. And so that's not a technical definition of a linear estimator. This is not a technical math class, and I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, suffice it to say, there are more complicated ways that use more complicated functions of the dependent variables. So OLS is a linear estimator. Simple to compute if you want to think about it that way, though it's not technically correct. Um, also, what is best? What do you mean it's best to use OLS sometimes and not best other times? What we mean by best is 
the minimum variance estimator, which in simple terms means the distance between our estimated slope and the real slope, the true slope, is going to be lowest. The kind of the expected distance between what we're estimating and the real slope is going to be as small as possible if you have the best estimator. And lastly, what is unbiased? We're going to, I'm going to show you a graphical explanation of this in just a second in part two. But I'm running out of time. Unbiased just means that on average, if a thousand people collect data and estimate a slope, half the people will overestimate the slope, their, their estimates will be too high, and half the people's estimates will be too low. On average, we're right. That's what basically what unbiased means.